Okay, thank you. I started the recording. Okay. okay. So now, now let us let us come back to Earth. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, plan of what I am going to talk today and tomorrow would be Hamiltonian reduction. With examples in dimensions zero to four. <laughs> Equivariant cohomology. In examples, well, not a fox, not focused. Mm -hmm. Sorry, <laughs> focused right now. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, equivalent cohomology, localization, mm -hmm. the usage in Hamiltonian reduction. And uh, we will be usage in Hamiltonian reduction once again in dimension 0 to 4. And uh, then we will study so-called gauged linear sigma models in dimension zero to four. And uh, I'm sorry to say, but this model in dimension four is just SU vortex string. So we will see it here. Okay. Okay, so, so this is the plan. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so let me start with Hamiltonian reduction. Before I'll describe Hamiltonian reduction, I'd like to mention that Hamiltonian reduction is the H going to zero limit of what we will say, what is of what? Of uh, sub manifolds in non commutative geometry. 
I just mentioned this fact. But uh, because you, you should know that I know it. However, I'll give my presentation in the semi-classical terms. So later on, we may discuss this phenomenon in detail. So we will discuss this fact in future. I think that in uh, 20 years from now, people would say that all these uh, old guys were studying this instead of starting with non-commutative geometry. However, now I will take the classical path. Mm -hmm. Okay. So taking this classical path, I'll say what I mean. <clears throat> Suppose we have a manifold, M. I will consider not the, not the most general case. I'll, con I'll consider a case that, uh, that we will use. It's a special case. Because all examples that I'm going to describe would fit into this special case. So suppose, many, suppose I have manifold M. Suppose I have omega, symplectic structure. Suppose I have the action of the compact Lie algebra. So uh, on M. So, and okay. Now I assume that this algebra preserves Symplectic form. Okay, so I assume this. Then <coughs> locally it means. that VA are Hamiltonian. So there is a set of functions such that IVA contracted into symplectic form is DHA. Then, so, so, so it is the data. Then, so called Hamiltonian reduction is the following prescription. You take H A equal to zero. And you factorize 
with respect to the action on this compact algebra Le by the compact group, okay, compact group. Uh, I'll call it G. Note that H A are defined up to constants. You see, we have this equation. So potentially there are constants. Okay, so so constants commute with everything. So when we say H A equal to zero, what we actually mean, we actually mean putting the putting this H A being equal to some constant. So now, I have to explain or motivate why this construction is not stupid, okay? There are several, so it's a construction. We will see examples, not only because this construction gives uh, nice examples. It's not stupid. It is not stupid because of two reasons. One reason comes from non-commutative geometry. In the non-commutative geometry that somebody will, be, will build later on, there Actually, are no parts. So, and, and Andrei was, was fixing H's to constants. Uh, I think when the, when the acting group is just a, just a torus, then that's fine. But when it's not, then if we if we want HAs to to uh, co combine into an equivalent yes, yes. moment map, then we want it to be not constants but quadrant orbits. Then okay, so I'm not, so. But you see, in this definition, in this definition, uh, I will say I will think about constants. I'm not going to consider the most general case. Okay. You will not get a syntactic manifold then uh, as a reduction if you uh, because, uh, because later on, later on, I will uh, so let me put it this way. First of all, so so mostly I will consider two cases, mm -hmm. a billion case. An abelian so, narrative is good. Uh, you see sometimes from the center, yes? So yeah. constants uh, may come from the center. So uh, you see, if these are not constants, it's another definition. You see, I can play with this, with this okay. step. But let me just imagine the thing go like this. Because for most purposes, it will be enough. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you see, if you have this orbit, it means that you have to define the, another degree of freedom, etc. Related to this orbit, you need to do to work. Con with it. Constants are quadrant orbits in the abelian case, so that's that's good. <laughs> okay. Yes. You see. Yes. Uh, you see. Uh, you see. I want. Uh, you see. I actually want to concentrate not on the details here. Mm -hmm. But uh, in going from zero to two to four. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want to explain zero. Uh, and of course, I will concentrate on zero for two reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, because it would be the starting point to go to two to four. That's one thing. Another thing is that construction that we'll have in two and four would borrow some uh, something from zero, okay? So, 
So one of the reasons is, is, is okay, I, I'll still come to this motivation, that functions are in commutative geometry. In non-commutative geometry, you have operator. Mm -hmm. So what you would like to call a submanifold is something like that. H equal to zero. What would it mean? It, it, it would mo most probably it would mean that H applied to some states equals to zero. We don't know what the states are, but uh, <coughs> so this is something strongly quantum. However, when we go to the classical limit, we think that these states, that on the states H's could be considered as functions. It's called the classical limit of quantum mechanics. That's why we put H to zero. Now, if we consider H to the first correction, H, it is not only evaluated at states, it also moves states. So H is evaluated on states in the degree zero and H moves states in the degree one in H, in Planck constant. So saying that H in the first order in Planck constant annihilate states means that we <coughs> to rise with respect to the group. And I am not ready to construct a complete non-commutative picture because the complete non-commutative picture would uh, would mean something more complicated. So, sorry, uh, I, di I, didn't, I didn't understand what you said about H, H in the first order. So h to the zero order means that the operator is a function. It is uh, it equals to some function in the space of states. Mm -hmm. So states in these marks. Mm -hmm. Then h to the first order. Yes. So to the first order, h is a uh, differential operator. So mm -hmm. in commutative h contains two things being a function and the vector field together. Yes. So decomposing it, we see that this H acting on states to the first order in plan constant moves these states. Mm -hmm. This capital H in the first order in plan constant moves the states. And you know my favorite example, so you are thinking in terms of geometric quantization? Yes. Okay. But I'm not doing quantization. Actually, I'm, I like to do classization. So I just so the, that uh, uh, this is a uh, quantum state. Oh. The, and, and in this, you see, observable and generator of evolution are the same things. So which is the main statement of quantum mechanics. You know my favorite example. Mm. So my favorite example is, consider the weight G representation of SU2. Here we have T1, T2, T3. Such that T i square sum over i equals j, j plus one. Consider T 
that I'll call classical. So that is Ti. Ti over J. So Ti classical, Tj classical, equals to epsilon i j k tk classical one over j. So when you when you turn j to infinity and know that j is h to the minus first, you have commutative algebra. And here and here you may write classical square. And here we have one, one over j. And here you have commutative algebra. And of course you have a sphere. Okay? And that's how the phase space appears. But this is at the leading order. In the subleading order, order, T, so T A classical is evaluated. However, T I, that is J T classical, is acting in a non-trivial way. Because uh, these generators do rotate representation. Ah, you're just talking about how Poisson brackets emerges. I yes, see. yes. But but I so I'm repeating the story to to show that in the complete quantum, in the complete quantum story, you should consider uh, the universal T. T with fixed J and then decompose it. Mm -hmm. So it, this T contains both function and uh, vector field. Together, they, they, they are coming together. When J is finite, you could not distinguish between function and uh, vector field. Mm -hmm. You are able to distinguish them only if you go to this J to infinity limit. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you consider T classical, it means that in order to see the vector field, you need to amplify T classical by this huge G or by dividing it by H. And this simplification of uh, the observable is actually the content of the so-called uh, Heisenberg equation, okay? So people mostly do not realize that Heisenberg equ equation says that a, a dot, A is an observable, is what? And here I have very important one over H, okay? Mm -hmm. So it means that here I'm using not the classical like, like this T classical, I'm using this T themselves. This H here is this simplification phenomenon. H classical is an operator that turns in the H small or H, H plank to zero to a function. And of course, function would commute. To see how the thing that would be function in this limit would move something, I have to put here amplification factor. Mm -hmm. So, so things that we consider differently, namely functions and vector fields in commutative geometry and relate them through Planck constant 
actually come together in the single operator. Moreover, we see it in this formula. Omega equals dH. You see here we see here we see what we call symplectic form. We know that symplectic form contains H in it. Secretly, yes. So if you try to reconstruct, if you try to ask where H is coming from, it is here. So this is a quantum formula. So since we don't have quantum formula, we we have it like this. You see, secretly we know that H comes together with omega. So this is called symplectic mechanics. Discovered in this form by Arnold, I think. This is something like Heisenberg. I think something like this. Approximate. Of course you know this, and of course you know this. I just want to remind you that these two formulas are related. That in strong quantum mechanics, where you do not have H bars, you do not have H classical too. And this is strong quantum mechanics, strongly coupled. And this formula is when H tends to zero. Sometimes it's possible to continue to finite H's, but its uh, actual meaning is the asymptotic formula. That's why I want to say that, uh, so all this is a command that the conditions of uh, Hamiltonian reduction are actually coming from non-commutative geometry that is not built yet, that people are trying to build. So people are actually trying to build non-commutative geometry in such a way that uh, Hamiltonian reduction would be its particular case. Okay. Mm -hmm. And since it, since it's not built, people just have different ideas. I'm not going to dis to to discuss it here. I just show that it is a problem for future. That this definition is not that crazy. It's not just two irrelevant equations. No, these are two equations coming from one non commutative equation. Okay. And uh, and you would not uh, read it everywhere. So in some texts you may read it. In some texts you may not read it. Okay. But don't you okay. have, don't you just mention that this, this symplectic reduction is kind of a, uh, the, just a leading order term of this? Yes, it is the oh, leading right. order of what would be non-commutative uh, equation or non-commutative manifold. Okay. You act by something on states. This something is an operator. So maybe you say that, ah, maybe you prefer D modules. 
Okay? So the module is the simplest case of this. So the module is a set of equation of the representation of differential operators. So representation of differ so differential operators is an is another example of non-commutative algebra, right? Moreover, it's a such nice algebra that clearly has classical limit. When you put a plane constant in front of differential operator. So it's actually a family of non-commutative algebras. Okay? And then the family oh. of non-commutative algebra, algebras, you want to look what? You want to look at the main object. So main object in commutative uh, geometry is, is a manifold, okay? Well, you say that uh, several elements of the big ring are zero. Here in a commutative case, you impose these conditions. And here I just mentioned uh, how you can decompose it. And the classical limit into, into two conditions that, that look uh, very different, okay? So it's, it's in mm. my command to do this equation. So perhaps uh, geometric quantization is a construction of non commutative geometry. It is one of the constructions, you see? Geometrical quantization is one of the constructions. Uh, my personal attitude, you see, I have my personal attitude, uh, and I hope it's correct, is that the word, quanti is that the word quantization is actually a wrong wording. Mm. What we actually should do is to consider classization, not quantization. The problem has to be reversed. We should start, if we can, with the fundamental... Uh, quantum systems, and then study their interesting limits. Yes. Because the uh, world is inherently quantum. Yes. However, it's very interesting to find its limits. Okay? Yes. So people should, should study not quantization, but classization. Now, why quantization is also important is because uh, we can consider a theory of uh, limiting something, okay? You know, in the functional theory, okay, we can study or we should study functions considered as maps from one space to another space. And also functions considered as a formal power theory, okay? And these two classes, have some overlaps called polynomials because polynomials are formal power series or say convergent series. They are, they are functions from the one hand side and they are formal series from the other, from other hand side. Okay. And uh, Sam, I'm answering, I'm trying to answer your question. And uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I would even try to give a picture here. Okay. Analogy. Analogy. Suppose we have space X, okay, complex, so function. Understood? Maps. So one way, second way, formal. Theory or even convergent. I will say that convergent theory are here in between. And there are different and there are interesting structures. Like if you have map, you can have diffeomorphism here. Okay.
And if you have formal theory, you have Lie algebra of formal diffeomorphism. And here is the region when you have convergence theory, when these two different approaches overlap. So here we have Lie algebras may be infinite dimensional. Here we have one type of manipulations with a formal theory. Here we have something very different. And here is an overlapping te technique. So the same happens with quantization. So when you say quantization, you are here. Quantization. When you speak about what? When you speak about uh, strongly quantum systems. It is like here. When you are here in between, it's a way where we can apply methods of both one and two. So, uh, so this is an analogy with this uh, deformation quantization. Sometimes, sometimes you see, sometimes, so in this analogy, when we consider maps, sometimes we have to define the maps as a convergence area, like exponential. It's a convergence area. It is the easiest way to define this map. So the same, the same happens here. So deformation quantization, you start with formal theory and you look, maybe it actually defines you a, uh, Maybe it actually defined with a quantum system. However, the general case is when you start with strongly quantum system. Okay, so it was command. Okay, it was heuristic command. So now I quit with heuristic commands. Now I'll continue with the, with the formulas. So let me comment reason why H was called moment map. So it actually was a reason because the people study in mechanics, rotation. And uh, And there, was a, and there was a notion of uh, momentum, rotational momentum. So that's what people studied from school. That momentum is uh, the, in school they call it vector product of momentum and coordinates. So, so when you study such thing at school, you don't even know what you, why you need to consider such an object. However, later in mechanics, you see, ah, you consider such an object because it, it's, uh, it generates you uh, the rotation. Because the most obvious group that you see around you is the rotation. And now you see, oh, it has uh, Hamiltonians. It has functions that generate, okay? So it's, uh, so it's the origin of the name.
there is another reason why uh, why it why it is good to consider Hamiltonian uh, reduction because the, so now so so in this case it's another reason it is related to the causes with respect to complex to action of complex that's why non compact groups and I'll command this too but now <coughs> let me first study examples So the first the first example that I'm going to study PPM So let me discuss this example in some detail. So I start with the C n plus one with coordinates Z naught Z naught up to Z n. Let me consider symplectic structure. Dz not dz not bar plus plus dzn dzn bar. Let me consider the action. Let me consider U1 action. ZA is go to the it is clear that this action preserves omega. It is clear. So we can look for Hamiltonians. So for Hamiltonian, I'm sorry. So here is the Hamiltonian. So we need to put it, okay. Now interesting thing. We may try to put it to zero and divide by the action of U1. It would not be great, of course, because it will be zero divided by U1. It's not interesting. However, we may consider this. I'll call it D capital. I'd like to put this to zero. Sorry, like this. D is a number, positive number. Now I see something interesting. 
I have two n plus one dimensional sphere, and I may divide it by u one. So if n capital is sorry two, I have n plus. Okay, yes. If n capital E equals to one, I have three dimensional sphere divided by U. <laughs> so I have something two dimensional. You may ask why. Uh, so how do I know that this thing? How do how do I know this thing? So everything is defined, but uh, you should know that this thing is nothing but S two. It's interesting how to compute it. So this is so this is S two, but this is but this is not uh, so. It, it could be done as an exercise, as you know. The easiest way to see that it is S two would be to do the following. Consider the north moduli square plus the one moduli square equal to one. Then, uh, by uh, then, uh, what can you do? Yes, I, I have two, two of them. Then you may put uh, the dot being real. So if, if the dot is not zero, So, uh, so everybody could make a sphere out of it. But, but it is not the general case. When they consider higher and greater than one, it would not be S to N. So this uh, example is kind of an occasional example. We need to understand what it is in the case N capital greater than one. And here the main idea is the following. Observe, observation. That uh, see uh, that. Uh, The solution to this equation modular U1 is equivalent 
to what? To Cn minus zero divided by C star. So U1 is the same. So what is uh, non-trivial here is that on the right hand side we have the quotient on the left hand side we have a submanifold so this statement actually means that the space of orbits is in one to one correspondence with the points on the submanifold. So one may ask how this happens or why this happens. So here let me give a reference to the great book of Donaldson. Who is the classic here? So starting from this, I refer to Donaldson book. However, I'll try to explain it close to the presentation that was given in Donaldson book because it is simple. It's actually simple. So this is orbit this is subspace so-called zero momentum subspace the tricky thing is that all orbits have only one intersection except by this orbit that is zero. So <clears throat> we need to understand why. Why only one intersection? Why intersection always happen? And here there is a nice trick that maybe explains something. A nice trick is the following. <clears throat> Compact group has a vector field Z D over DZ. A from zero to M minus Z bar D over D Z bar non compact group. Has plus had plus sign here. Here we have plus. So when we have plus, we have the following. When the compact group acts. It of course preserves Hamiltonian. Surely, because uh, group generated by a function preserves this function. However, let us see on what happens when the non compact case. Let us make, make a computation. The A 
over dz a plus z bar a d over dz a bar. It's an Euler vector field applied to Hamiltonian. It brings what? It actually brings to H. So here I consider as H just modulo z squared. I'm taking so sum of squares. Okay. Okay, I'll put here the, the sum of squares. Actually, actually one, not two. And you see, this is strictly positive. Okay. It means that when I consider the flow according to the non compact group, H, okay, H minus D monotonically. Grows. Okay. So for Z equal to zero or around zero, it is negative. For Z big, it is positive. So if you have a function that monotonically grows and goes from being negative to positive, you have only one intersection where it is zero. And this proves the theorem. Moreover, you may see that uh, this thing is positive everywhere besides the point that is zero. So that's why if it's zero, it is zero. That's why I proved, I proved that the CN plus one over C star minus zero is actually this H equal to one over U one. So Hamiltonian reduction is the quotient with respect to non compact group. And actually, this fact is used in many, many generalizations. So now I need to make a break. Okay. So, uh, so somehow I explained the situation in dimension zero, and now I'll come to field theory generalizations of it. Okay. After the five minutes break. So I'm sorry because some people know it. Some people don't know it. Some people know it in dimension zero. Some people know it in dimension zero and two. So the same thing in dimension four is uh, already kind of non-trivial. So that's why I have to put things together. I really want to entertain the audience and uh, being understandable. Like uh, Pavel criticized me for being non-understandable about this stream. I'm trying to be understandable. So, so maybe, I, maybe I go too slow. Oh, let us ask Donald. Donald, are you yes. here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, am I going too slow? Should I go faster? No, this, this is good. At least for me. So this was uh, very nicely put and very nicely explained. So 
I'm okay. I'm good. I'm very good. Okay, so I'll, I'll be back uh, in five minutes. <laughs>
okay. I tried five minutes to be actually five minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, from this, let me give you a definition of the toric manifold. Okay, in this way. So uh, I do not like some definitions of toric manifold. I'd like to give it according <coughs> to this to this presentation. So. Oh. Let us consider toric manifold as a factor, as a Hamiltonian reduction. Of the following form, consider C n divided by C star to the power k, and here cut out something of lower dimension. So it is pre-definition. Okay, it's not a definition yet. Because I have not explained what I am cutting out. However, already already from this definition or pre-definition, you may see that C star to the power n minus k should act. Product here. Because it acts here. So I'd like to make this redefinition as follows. So uh, toric manifold is a Hamiltonian reduction. Hamiltonian reduction is written with these two. I forgot to say that it's written with this double flash over U1 K. So what should I uh, define to make this reduction? First, I need to explain the charges okay you see so physicists like the world charges and mathematicians like the world weights 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 maybe i misspelled this weights but okay no it's fine fine okay so what are these this is a set of integers. So it's a table. So for each n going from one to here, I need to set out, I need to have these charges. So I call them Q one, QN. And here I have uh, one, etc. Q one K Q and K. So this is this M times K integer matrix. So in the particular cases here, it was all a lot of ones and the total number was n plus one <laughs> but it's not the only thing that i have to do i also have to put 
here. Constants in moment map. So this is a number that I will call D1 DK. So altogether, I have to write down K Hamiltonian. U A. So here are charges. Z A squared minus B. Here from one to n, and I goes from one to to t. So this, so I have this combinatorial data. In this combinatorial data, so these are integers. Because I'm talking about uh, u1, and u1 has integer weight. Well, these are real numbers. Then you may say, look, in this definition, So different Ds could correspond to the to, to the same manifold. I say okay. Why not? It's because when I consider this factor, I can take uh, D equals one and D equals two are the same. D equals zero is different. So I consider this is a singular case and D negative means that we have an empty space. So it is not very transparent example showing what is going on. To see transparent example, I should consider not CP1, CPN. I should consider other cases that I'll do immediately. So for a moment, I'll restrict myself with K equals to one. However, I will play with weights and I will play with D. Okay, so I have to, to simplify my life. You see, I have to solve these equations. So in order to solve them effectively, I'd like to go to the following coordinates. R, let me define Ra is Z A square. Okay. Now things would be easier. Because I also know that R A is positive. Okay. Very positive. No negative. So in these coordinates, it's very easy to solve equations. So, so let me see how I'm doing it. So first, 
Let me reconsider CP1. It is R0 plus R1 minus D equal to 0. R0, R1, minus D. Here is D. So I'm going here, 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 and uh, then it goes away. So how do I see here sphere? To see the sphere, I need to know that I have actually two other coordinates. You see, this is about the moduli of Z. So Z A, let Z A be square root of R A times I to the I phi A. Then the, these angles decouple from this equation. So I have, of course, coordinates phi a mod. I have a common u1 mod common shifts. In this particular case. So what do I know? I know that everywhere here I have two angles minus psi angle. I have one angle. So here I have something like a tube. Interesting thing happens when I reach the boundary, say. When Z1 equals to zero, angle phi one, phi one disappears. Actually, zero has no angle. You may see that it means that uh, the corresponding circle shrinks. So here, it means above, it means along this line and also along this line, my angle counting is one angle minus one angle psi. So zero angles. It means that, it means that here, I do not have angle coordinate. It means that this, uh, circle is shrink to a point. So I have a description of CP1. As a tube. Together with two disks attached. These disks correspond to this point. These disks correspond to this point. And here I have this tube. You may also see, say that it's a C star with two points. This C star that stands here uh, is a piece of the definition. That's why we call it toric manifold. It's because uh, this is an algebraic torus. So real torus is this one several times. Algebraic torus is C star several times. Okay, so that's you see when I have a tube and two discs, I see that, that this is the sphere, so I have no problems here. Now let me consider still, let me consider a case where I have C square. Once again, 
divided by u1 with the charges equal to 1 plus 1 and minus 1. Then I will have the line like this R0 minus R1 equal to D. So I know how to draw up this line. It doesn't matter what is D. The solution to this equation is this line. First of all, I see that it is non-compact. Good. Also, I have this angle shrinking phenomena only at one point. So I see that the manifold that I'm getting is, is this. So I can easily see that this is C star together with zero. This is C. Okay. Still, I see that there is clearly an action of, uh, of C star on it. So it acts here and it's of course acts here. Okay. So actually there is nothing else that I can have in, uh, in this game. I can have either this or that. So the, the different angle doesn't change too much in topology. So in order to find something interesting, I should try to study C cube over U1. So simplest possible case is when I put Q Q's Q1 equal to one, Q2 equal to one, Q3 equal to one. So these uh, numbers are called weights. And, and would I put here not one by two or three, I'll call it weighted projective manifold. Uh, sometimes you, you see such definition. So, I have to draw a picture. R0 plus R1 plus R2 equals to D. Okay, so this is clearly a triangle. So now I have one circle shrinking on the plane and two shrink circles shrinking on the line. So what I have, I have a triangle. So everywhere above here, I have S1 times S1. Once again, I have three angles, phi one, phi two, phi three, minus psi. So it means that I have two angles. However, something is shrinking on the coordinate planes. And two things are shrinking on the coordinate lines. So uh, you may see something that uh, already has non-trivial topology. So how do I know that it has non-trivial topology? I may consider the fiber above this line. And I see that it is my old sphere. So I clearly see sphere inside. And I can see that it is non-contractible. A 
then I may ask, uh, then I may ask why this sphere or not this sphere. Okay, I can take another sphere. I see that these two spheres uh, intersect at one point, etc. So here I have very effective combinatorical way to describe the manifold. I can uh, draw some cycles here. I can even count the intersection number. Okay, so, th so in this way, this is the picture for uh, CP2. Now, once again, playing with D is not that effective. Everything could shrink to zero. However, now I have another opportunity. And this opportunity is to play with signs here. Okay. You see that if I change these numbers, keeping all signs positive, I will just uh, rotate the triangle and nothing would actually change in topology. Now let me take Q3 equal to minus one. You may study what would happen uh, in two ways. Geometrically or algebraically. So let us first start with algebra. How to solve these equations? R1 plus R2 minus R3 equals to D. Together with R1, Ri being positive. So actually, what is interesting is the following. There are two cases. First case, D being positive. And second case, D being negative. So if D is positive, we can say that for any R3, So, uh, so we are so we are trying to find out solution. So, for any R three, including R three equal to this zero, this is positive, and that means that we have some non-trivial line here. Okay. So it means that for R three equals so uh, three is the third component. So for R three equals zero, we have this line, and then it grows somehow. So, so 
So the space of solution looks like this. Okay, let me arrange something. By the way, I, I actually start to think that uh, this uh, should be a piece of the first year students program or second year students program, because it is simple and beautiful and this kind of universal, some universal knowledge of geometry. So for D is positive, we have this thing. So this is what replaces triangle. Now let us see what happens when D is negative. R1 plus R2 equals to R3 minus modulo of D. It means that when R3 goes down, down to D. At some moment, there is no more solution. Okay? So, uh, so what does, so what does it mean? How can I write it? It's again, the intersection of the plane, of course it's a plane, yes? But now plane intersects like this. So you see, there is a plane that intersects the vertical line. For D negative, it intersects the vertical line here with positive R3. Otherwise, it intersects here. And instead of this tra non-compact tra trapezia, we have, uh, how to say, the sector. So the size of this interval goes to zero, and that's what happens. Now, let us see on this interval. This is this interval uh, actually is such that uh, above this integral, this interval, we have a sphere. So here we have a cycle like CP1 that at some moment shrinks. So what we see, we see the change of topology. And we can find the moment when topology changed. So we see an interesting phenomenon. Phenomena is that uh, the topology of Hamiltonian reduction is piecewise continuous. There are special places when it uh, changes. So later on, we will study cohomology ring or something, and we will see jumps. So for some reason, uh, people either say jumps or call Donaldson jumps because Donaldson studied such jumps in uh, the theory of Donaldson invariance. But of course, we would like to see these jumps already here. Okay, 
So basically, this is what happens. So in this example, should we recognize something familiar as the, as, as the reduction? Yes, of course. So this is, of course, C squared. Ah, yes. Yes. And this is C squared with a point blown up. Mm -hmm. So, so the outcome, so the outcome of this description is that here we have very constructive way to define the class of manifolds. You give this data, you study the topology, you need to work a bit, but uh, this is a problem. You see, in order to study topology, it's not that hard. You need to study equations like this. You need to, to check if, your, if the solution of set of linear equations is positive or negative. Here, the key issue is the positivity of this uh, ri. So equations are linear, but uh, the type of solution is restricted because these r's are positive, OK? So the charges are just a normal vector. So you can see the normal vector, the direction of the normal vector. Uh, charges, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, you may say this way too. So uh, if you want to study the non-compact group, yes. But it is, uh, but it is the vector of, you see, I prefer, uh, you see, it's the way how to look at it. I prefer to study it as the intersection of the uh, hyperplane with this corner, with the coordinate corner. Yes. In any case, you can uh, pick up combinatorics out of it. And, uh, and you are sure that there is no physics or analysis or anything complicated here. If you need to study this, you go to computer. What? So, after all this, let me put let me put in other examples that are kind of interesting. Okay. Because now I'm going to go to field theoretical examples. Okay. So, would it be only geometry? Uh, you you would have another speaker, okay? So my speciality is that I that I can see and explain this these things in quantum field theory. So let me consider the first example. Dimension equal two. And let me consider the space of connections on Riemann surface sigma. So as far as I remember, the, these constructions are either to Hitchin or to Atya or to both. I don't remember who was the most contributor. It should be Atya, but probably. OK, but it's the name. We, are, uh, we would like to see the construction. Now, what are connections on sigma? So topologically, all bundles on the sigma are classified by C1. So it's an integer. So let us consider bundles that are topologically trivial. Ah, so you want bundles? No, not you want. <laughs> but you see, there is no place for C2. 
on the base. Okay. As people say in K theory, C1 corresponds to, like C1, C2, etc., correspond to any bundle. Okay? No, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure that this is true. Uh, can't I have a uh, Stephen Whitney class? Yes, you can. So, uh, okay, uh, I, I will say this Stephen Whitney class are a bit like a bit like C1. Okay, you are right. So, uh, so these uh, these are torsions, but uh, let me, for simplicity, study topological trivial bundle. Okay. I think you are right. So, if I study okay, SO, SO3 bundles, then there is more. What? If I study, let's say, bundles with group SO3, then I should be more careful. Yes. So, uh, so in topological trivial bundles, we can uh, have uh, some connections. are just one forms. With values in the adjoint representation. And I can consider the symplectic form on this space. On space of connections. It's actually a symplectic form because uh, here, so form, uh, so you take a tangent vector. I call it delta A. It's, it's again a one form. Because it's uh, so connections written this way in form a linear space. So uh, this is variation of connection, this is variation of connection. I can multiply them, take trace. Now, I, I, I want to have some group. So the only natural group is a group of gauge transformations. And uh, I may ask, what is the Hamiltonian? So what should be the Hamiltonian? So I told you to, that for any A, there should be HA. Now, the, the gauge transformation, infinitesimal gauge transformation, of course, are described by fields with values in a joint. Now there is a great statement. Is that the Hamiltonian associated to epsilon is this, where f is da plus a squared. It is possible to check directly that this is a gauge of transformation. Mm -hmm. 
By the way, computation is very simple. The simplicity of this computation uh, is based on the fact that uh, F contains a linear term and quadratic term. That's very easy to find the, the vector fields. So of course, if we put here, if we consider a D A term, it is clear that the vector field should be constant vector field constant in space of A's. But the value of this constant is of course D epsilon. It means that A go to A plus D epsilon. Now, consider this A squared term. Let me write it in coordinates. Computation here go like, go exactly like in a zero dimensional case. This is actually direct infinite dimensional analog of momentum. I mean rotation momentum. And this term gives, of course, A going to epsilon A I want to say that it's not surprising, and that is kind of simple. So, so what is the space? That is the Hamiltonian reduction space. So what is the Hamiltonian reduction? Hamiltonian reduction is take F, put it equal to zero. And then take a quotient by the gauge transformation. And this is of course, the moduli space of flat connections. Mm -hmm. So F equal to zero, it's an, it's an analog of the sphere, S n plus S to n plus one. And this gauge transformation is an analog of U1 rotation. Now, all this knew nothing about the complex structure at all. I'd like, he, I'd, I'd like to play here similar game. To play the similar game, I would like to introduce, so at the moment, no complex structure. Introduce complex structure. On the space of connections. So how can I do it? I First, I need to pick complex structure. And we don't worry about the fact that the reduction is singular. Um, I 
let me let me see. Sometimes. Hmm. You mean that if uh, Stephen Whitney class. Is no, 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 not, nothing to do with Stephen Whitney classes. Just if you take, I don't know, SU2 group, still the, the reduction is singular. There will be exploding stabilizers. Okay, so let, let, let me put it this way. Let mm -hmm. us consider this as a first approximation, okay? Mm -hmm. Because uh, because later on, uh, I would say that I would I would I would not like to study uh, exactly this case, mm -hmm. okay? Because this would be the theory with no matter, right? Purely so it will be purely gauge theory that I don't. That, I, that maybe I would not like to study. So, so later I'll come to the theory and maybe there it would be important to study stabilizer. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so let, let, let me consider this as a first, first approach, you see? Mm -hmm. So I would like to say this is approximately where, where we are trying to go. Mm -hmm. Because because up to now everything was purely real. Mm -hmm. Now I would like to do the following. I would like to pick complex structure on sigma. And then I can decompose a mu dx mu into a z d z plus a z bar d z bar that is uh, so called one zero and zero one parts. And here I will put bar because later on I'll prefer to omit this z bar z bar. I would like to call this. This thing I'll also call a bar. It is important to say that this decomposition not only exists, and this decomposition is kind of natural. And let me try to explain why. Why this complex structure is natural complex structure that has geometrical meaning? It's important because you see the space of uh, connections is just a linear space. I can introduce probably many different complex structures in it. Moreover. When we, when uh, Edward Witten plays with n equals two theory, with n equals four twisted theory in four dimensions, and also when Hitchin makes some constructions, there are several complex structures on the data that could be made. And uh, Witten in particular has the, the full CP1 of complex structure. And he's playing with it doing Langlands, okay? But I'd like to say that here, this A bar has independent meaning, not just as piece of the complex structure. Actually, this A bar would be interesting. Holomorphic coordinate in the complex structure. Define. And you may ask, why should I put, why should I call something definitely anti-holomorphic a holomorphic coordinate of the space of uh, yeah, 
the holomorphic coordinate on the space of connections. Hmm? At the moment, at the first sight, it seems unreasonable. Okay? So people would naively think that uh, they would rather call some holomorphic object holomorphic on the space of structures and not anti holomorphic. Okay? So here so, I so need the, to explain something. So, so a bar, you, you are saying a bar is, is a holomorphic coordinate on what? On the space of connections. Mm. A bar and not A. Mm -hmm. Pasha, you know that uh, I am tropicalizing presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay? It means that I am stressing uh, non trivial points. Okay, the points that I consider are not real, non obvious. Okay. So you may ask why a bar is something that should be considered as holomorphic coordinate. And here, here I'll give an explanation. Okay. Immediately. So when there is a question, it is a time for explanation. If there is no question, all explanations are useless. It is. We can do the following. We can consider a differential operator, DA bar. So why? So this operator, of course, X on sections. Acting on sections of the boundary. Then you may ask why we are interested in constructing uh, differential operators. So, are, are we doing partial differential equations or what? And the answer is the following. We we are studying these differential operators in order to define a sheaf. That's what we are going. That's where we are going. We are going to define a sheaf. And the definition of the sheaf is like this. Consider a covering of the base. For each uh, U alpha, consider the vector space of sections S alpha such that D Z bar plus A Z bar on S alpha equals to zero. Space of locally holomorphic functions. Space of locally holomorphic sections. It's not just a vector space. This space is actually a O module. It means that if F alpha is holomorphic function on U alpha, Then F alpha S alpha is also holomorphic section. Ah, you see how we are using this A bar. We are using this A bar to construct 
זה שיף, זה או שיף, אוקיי? And, and after we construct this O shift, we can prove that this O shift is locally free, okay? And that's why it's a holomorphic bundle. So uh, you see here I gave a reasoning <clears throat> in terms of or in terms of what? In terms of uh, algebraic geometry. So what you explained is that a bar is the coordinate on the space of holomorphic bundles. Yes, so, they bar, so a bar is a natural parameterization on the space of holomorphic bundle. Mm -hmm. because, because the structure fun, uh, the structure, I would say, ingredient, you see this operator, so I'm sorry, uh, I have to put bars here. This ingredient is something that produces Holomorphic bundle. Mm -hmm. So having D, D bar A bar, you immediately get holomorphic bundle. Mm -hmm. This construct, uh, you see, this construction should be compared with, you see, it's not a construction alone. You may ask, how do we get this uh, shift O itself? How to get O oh, in the same way, okay, as we get the, uh, this module. There is a similar construction. You consider D mu. So you have a globally defined Beltrami differential. You consider globally defined differential operator. However, the space of uh, sections of uh, zeros of this debug. And you study this equation on the open covering. And solutions to this equation form a shift O. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the way, this is a universal construction that works in uh, any dimension. The only condition, so if you, do, if you forgot this construction, let me recall this construction because it's important not only for Riemann surfaces, it's important everywhere. It is a differential geometric way to get O. You study these operators. Actually, in higher dimensions, it's not only one operator. In higher dimensions, it's D bar plus commutator of D and mu. So actually, it's something like D Z bar Y, D bar mu I. Set of operators. And you say that you define a, a holomorphic structure on the manifold, you find the holomorphic structure shift when? 
when these debars have enough solutions. Because here there is a problem. Here to have enough solution. And the problem is, of course, I think it's called torsion. In this case, there is enough solution. So that you can make a shift. And this condition is known as Kadair uh, Spencer. And you know, then there, then there was a Frobenius theorem that you have a local differential operators. You want to see how many solutions there are. So the problem is, of course, when you can use these differential operators, you can get a new differential operator. That would put the dimension of the space of solutions down. So we have this condition. If you think about uh, holomorphic bundles, everything is the same. So in higher dimensions, you will again get d bar a and the integrability conditions would be like this. So this is a view on this uh, complex dimension one uh, construction from the higher dimensional perspective. By the way, complex dimension two, so by the way, we will meet later on complex dimension two case. But at the moment, I just recall these constructions. By the way, note that when people were writing down names of the objects, they were wise enough to call this guy mu and not mu bar. Okay. So they had two choices, z here and z bar here. Okay. The question was how to call it. Okay. They realized that it's clever to call it mu and not mu bar. So holomorphic coordinates uh, on the complex structures uh, are coming from mu, okay? While, while for connections, uh, unfortunately notation is different. Having a z bar, people, roll, people call that a bar. Okay, so in this way, we, I, I explained what is the space of uh, connections, what is the complex structure, and that's why, well, well, and that's why, well, what are the forms, okay? And of course, one can do, one can try to play similar game. And similar game is, complexify these gauge transformations that are here. Okay, so let me see. Ah, I, it, it seems that I'm running out of time. But still, I'd like to advertise. So it will take time, but there is so-called narrative Hans Shardi. That says that the space of holomorphic bundles, this is the space of I bar with respect to the 
complex gauge transformations. Is isomorphic to the space of flat connections. So you see, interesting. This is this seems to be a topological space. Yes. Flat connections are representations of pi one, right? Pasha, do you agree? Yes. And this seems to seems to do something with the complex geometry. Mm -hmm. And there is this Narasimhan Sishardi theory. So since I have only 15 minutes, let, let me briefly show that you have to add a stable condition, stable holomorphy like bonus. Yes, yes, yes. And you are right. Complex, of course, stable. So stable here, stable here is an analog of taking zero or uh, some locus out in the toric case. And, and you can play with this. But what I'd like to say here is that uh, There are two generalizations that are of this that are important in physics in dimension two. I, I can consider the following space A bar and the uh, set of sections. I call them S A, A going from one to K. Sections of the bundle. Now, what kind of sections should I consider? I would like to consider not smooth sections, but of course holomorphic sections. So I would like to consider solutions to this equation. And of course, there are the gauge information. And the gauge information is gauge information acts on sections, it acts here. So I do it up to gauge transformations. Then here everything is holomorphic. And of course, here I have complex gauge transformation. Now I can write a real theory of Hamiltonic of Hamiltonian reduction here. And then this may be replaced by what? This may be replaced by what? By uh, imposing one more condition together with the compagation information. One may look, what is the momentum map here? And it's interesting that momentum map is, of course, curvature. But this is momentum map for gauge fields. 
but not only curvature. Of course, there should be momentum map for sections. So something like this. It's exactly the formula that I wrote. I'll put charges here. Let me put it in these marks. What is interesting here is that this is a two form. And this is not a two form, this is a function. So the only way to make them work together is like this. And this is the moment map. And I'll discuss it in some detail. Because what you can actually see here is the so-called content of gauged linear sigma model. So it's SS bar and then what after, after S bar, I, I didn't see. I, I said Q. Mm -hmm. So this is the moment map. Okay. And uh, tomorrow, to, uh, and uh, this is a two-dimensional analog of the moment map that I defined so far. And I have the measure on sigma here. And I don't have measure here because symplectic form on uh, connections is topological. While, sim while symplectic form on uh, sections is, of course, non-topological. You, you take a moduli square, but you need to integrate. And that's why there is a measure here. And uh, it is exactly this formula that is responsible for vortices and many other phenomena. Okay? And then you may ask me that uh, I have never mentioned the analog of this equation, like dA bar S alpha equals to zero. What, so does this equation ha has an analog in uh, zero dimension? How do you think? Does it correspond to the constant di you choose in the moment map? No, this no constant is here. And this constant would be phi a Leopoldus. <laughs> but here, look, this thing is nothing but the holomorphic what? Holomorphic equation. So the zero dimensional analog of this term is of course uh, hypersurface. So at, at, at the moment, I consider the here reduction. But I could also put in some equations, hypersurfaces or, uh, and uh, I will get the end intersection theory on uh, the actually complete intersections uh, divided by the complex group. So it's the maximal thing that I would like to have. So this, so the zero dimensional case is not just CN acting by some group G. But uh, hypersurfaces, okay. Manifold. And here you act by group G. So you take CN. So, uh, okay. 
pack of C Z1 Vn divided by ideal generated by some W. And u divided by g. So this is the most general zero-dimensional story. Like quintic in uh, CP four. That, uh, that that gives you Calabiao. So whenever you have something in projective space, you have this. You have equations that are homogeneous with respect to the group, and then you take the group. So people, people used to call it complete intersection in weighted projective spaces, or complete intersection in Grassmannians, etc. So this is roughly speaking something quadratic in the infinite dimensional space, if you just write it down. Mm -hmm. The notion of being quadratic is not well defined, but this is holomorphic in natural holomorphic structures on the, on the space of sections and connections. Okay. So, so let me say that this is the announcement for tomorrow. So and Andrei, I'll continue tomorrow. Andrei, just one uh, organizational thing. Tomorrow's talk should not be a continuation of today's talk because you have different people today and tomorrow, right? So uh, they are supposed to be independent seminars or, or I don't know, or, or Pasha, at least- Pasha, yes. you know what I say? You are right. No, I don't, I don't know, or at least no, maybe no. that's, uh, yes. maybe you have overlapping yes, audience. Yes, 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 of course, of course. So I will continue, so I will continue this uh, next week in the regular time, okay? Mm -hmm. Pasha, thank you. <laughs> no, that's, uh, you see, I, I, I have to be taken care of, you see? You you All need right. to direct me in the proper the in the proper place. You see, right? No, that's a very interesting story. I would like to hear the continuation of it. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would like to present it to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank so you. Uh, so so tomorrow, in this way, in this case. Ah, uh, so what should we discuss tomorrow? Dong, what should we discuss tomorrow? So I was thinking about, so this would be, a, this would be something new, but uh, have you checked my mail I sent, I've sent you today? Today, today not, today not yet. Because okay. Today, no. ah, you mentioned okay. the work of Misera when we talked about this high residue ah, pattern. You see, I, I like to discuss work of Misera. Yeah, so they, a, a, any work of Misera. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I, let I, us go according to rules. You give the topic. Okay. Yes, yes. And, and I'll tell you what I know on this topic. Okay. Yeah, I think I think that would be a very good topic because I find it really fascinating. But there is something that I really can't, can't understand directly in the mathematics in the mathematics perspective. So I'm gonna I have some questions. Okay, good, good, good. So the main thing is tradition. You see, we have seminars at that time, that time with this audience and that audience, right? Pasha, do you agree? Uh, I agree with everything. Okay. So, uh, and the rest people would have uh, the recordings of the talk with Dong on Misera on the internet. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So
So then see you tomorrow in 3 p.m. in Beijing time. Yes, yes, 3 p.m. Beijing time, Misera. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, goodbye. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Okay, thank you very much for today. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.